Today's lecture is about composite beams, and you might have seen them in your day-to-day -day businesses, your house, in construction, buildings, or outdoors. And let me look at a picture, or let me look for a picture of a, so what is a comp or what should be a composite beam typically found? Let me see if I can find. Yeah, this one. Yeah, something like this. Let me move it to this. So composite beams are those beams that are assembled using two or more materials. So, so that this case, for example, you have um, presumably a steel eye profile, and on the side you have a couple of wooden parts or beams also, let's call it like that. Also, you can find composite beams such as those formed by concrete and steel. Also, you have composite beams formed by, uh, this is another good picture, by steel or aluminum and form uh, kind of some isolation in, in the middle of between those two parts, for example, in this case. Also, this is an I beam, and then you have these wooden parts here. So, this is a nice representation. Let me look at another one. Maybe this one from here. So this type of beams that nowadays, for example, in construction, you have a concrete and then an isolation material, and then more concrete, and in between there are certain reinforcing bars like steel bars and stuff. But there is a purpose for choosing these type of beams in your design or in your project like that. So this is, for example, supposed to be cardboard. Uh, have you seen when you tear up cardboard, you see that the cardboard has a couple of layers, top and bottom, but then it has a corrugated screen in between. And one of the principles for that, for example, if we focus on this one here, it's hard to, let me just bring it to, on this one here, is that when we talk about beams, naturally we're talking about flexion at some point. Okay, because we're using columns also, but if we restrict our discussion to beams that work on the flexion, the moment, on the flexion moment, then one of the key important parameters on the design of those beams is what is called the kind of the moment curvature or the flexural formula or the the, the Euler Bernoulli equation to calculate the uh, let's say the, the stresses due to bending. And in general terms, uh, let's call it like this here, the Euler Bernoulli equation says something like this. So it's sort of like uh, the stress equals to these are the bending moment, and then you have the, the distance from the middle axis to a certain point where you want to calculate the stress. And then what you have here at the bottom is the moment of inertia, or something like that. So when you look at that equation, uh, you see that the moment of inertia plays a very important role in the magnitude of the stress. So meaning that if you have, actually this formula is is amazing because it says uh, at some point or integrates the relation between three parameters. You have uh, the marker here. So you have load, or let me choose another color. You have load or loading K. Yes. And then you have with the I and the Y, uh, you have the geometry of the thing here. Mark it here. And then at some point you have that uh, the stress that what which is the value that you want to find uh, in the end of things, you know. And all of these is dependent to say that in a way that it covers let me write it down again here. I'm just trying to look for a picture but in the meantime but I don't seem to find a good one to show you this. Mm. Uh, just a second, let me search for that picture maybe. Uh, I thought I had it at hand, but no, I don't have it here. No, I don't have it here. Okay, but anyway, and then you have here the stresses, which is what you want to calculate. And then you could englow, for example, this y and i into something called, called i divided by 
y is called w when you take the i the y sorry the y as the distance from the middle axis to the farther farthest away point that you want to calculate or where the maximum stresses are going to be presented so this is going to be presented as a section module now coming back to the why i'm writing this so the reason for this is that if you see y uh, the, the sorry i the moment of inertia for this figure here so even though Imagine that we have aluminum or a, a very thin plate of steel or aluminum here, and we have some foam or isolation of material that here, which, let's say, uh, is, let's call it in this way, it's non, not as resistant as the steel. So, but because of the separation, structural separation of steel plates at a certain distance, so this moment of inertia is still going to be large. So, if it is large, then you can, at some point, cheat the system in that way that it's going to they provide you with more stress resistance than having the two planes that they put together alone. So this, and this is amazing. This is why this is important. And also on the other side, if you use this kind of construction, what you're going to have is that the weight of the beam is going to be very is going to be lower than if it were manufactured completely out of steel. Then structurally is an advantage to have this kind of composite beam in our disposal. So it is said also that, well, so no, it is like that, that you know, planes, the construction of on the airplanes, for example, is made out of composite beams. So imagine that when we're flying on, on those planes, that what is kind of dividing us from the interior to the outside conditions are very thin layers of aluminum. And but at the same time, that makes the whole structure of the airplane very lightweight. So these are what are called composite beams. Within the composite beams, there are specific type of beams, like on purposely what I marked here, which are called Sandwich beams, like this, like a word sandwich beams, and they are mainly symmetric, symmetrical. So in any axis that you see them, they are symmetrical. But it's like you are making a sandwich. So that's why they're called sandwich beams. And there is a specific method to approach problems that use sandwich beams, and kind of a different from the one that you would use in the general case, and which you know would make your life easier. You think so. Those are what we call you know, composite beams. And what's the theory behind calculating the stresses for composite beams? Well, the theory is pretty much the same as uh, a one material beam. The only thing is that we need to introduce the fact that you know, we are not using just one material, material but two materials. And to promise, this is going to be shorter than the other uh, sessions. So everything starts with the definition of strain, also what's happening with the strain there. So just if I try to draw, for example, a beam, similar beam here. Or a composite beam. Uh, let me see this one. So we have, let's to draw it. Like this. So we have a beam like this. So let me open face. So like this. And then we have, imagine that this is going to be a composite beam. This. But then to make it a little bit more complex, this composite beam is going to be tapered, meaning that it's not going to be. Kind of very symmetrical in, in, in both axes in that sense. So this one in here, and then we have another one here. This. So this is one one beam conforming to a line here. So we have another line here, and then let's assume that we have some sort of stand here or base that we're going to be. And then between there's another material, I'm going to draw it like this. So imagine that. Very exaggerated here. And then we can so this beam affects to this beam affects to this wall, and then there is certain forces applied or moments applied to it. You can see this one here, for example, a force. Then, if I look at the section of this beam, no, I can feel this. Why is not feeling it like this? So if this is the section. One thing I know for sure 
under a Cartesian coordinate system regarding the deflection of the beam, if I take a Cartesian coordinate system, something like this, where this is y and this is z, and then it would be that we have x in this direction here, is that the deformation of this beam is going to be smooth, meaning that imagining that we have a beam with two materials, material one and material two, and that they are bonded in the interface perfectly or ideally, meaning that there is no any relative movement between those two surfaces here, and also that all, all the forces are transmitted as they should be, then the only thing that we know in this case is that the deformation of this section is going to be very smooth, meaning that if I draw three lines here, one, one in the top, one in the interface, and one at the bottom here, then I could draw the, so the deformation such as it is something like this. So we have, remember at the, at the bottom, we have a deformation here, and then this is going to do something like this. So we have a straight line like this, and then we have this something like this. And look, I didn't draw the the point where this is for deformation, yeah, in X, in X. the deformation in X, so the strain in X. So, so the strain in X, I didn't put the point of zero strain be equal to the, 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 the interface part here. It's because it might be possible that the neutral axis on the section that you are working with does not coincide with the neutral axis of the of the part. So meaning that it might be possible that the centroid of this is going to be located in here. So if I try to polish this a little bit, rotate point A. So this could be kind of dashed lines, something like this. So where then this is the centroidal axis or surface, depending on how you see it. Then this is the neutral axis. And why the difference between both of them? Well, because you know the unsymmetrical characteristics of the cross section. And also we know that stress is related to strain, yeah, and uh, the modulus. So meaning that if you find a point where the stress is the strain is zero, then you're, you're, you're not going to have any strain there. Yeah, the stress is there. Sorry for that. So the only thing we know in here is that strains are going to be smooth. But as we're talking about two different materials, and those two different materials most probably are going to have two different ion modulus or moduli. So it means that the distresses are not going to behave like we are presenting the strains here. Like this one here. Any questions so far? So then we know that this description, this variation of strain across the cross section of that beam can be described as, for example, I can write, we know it, in terms of the, the distance in y from the neutral axis, like this, and the radius of curvature. This is the radius of curvature. Curvature. Then this is distance from the middle axis. I got a question I'm going to answer it in a few seconds. Just let me finish writing this. Uh, distance from the middle axis. Distance from this band. Oh, this is a distance to write that. From middle axis. Okay, I got a question on the question first. Uh, the neutral axis is not the same as the interface of the materials, right? They're only in this example. Mm -hmm. Let me try to answer that question. The neutral axis is not the same as the interface of the material. So, no, no, so, Regardless of we're talking about composite beams or let's say 
or just one material beam. So neutral axis happen when oh that's another confusion there. Yeah. Another confusion then. Sorry about this. So let me rephrase this. So sorry about that. So this is the interface. Interface process. So the interface on, uh, surface, of course, depends on the construction construction of the composite beam, and it might or it might not be coincident with the neutral axis. That's something that uh, that you're right. So it's not. It depends on the on the sample. It depends on the construction. For example, if we're talking about here on the sample beam, definitely the inter there are going to be two interfaces. So the one here and the one at the bottom. So the neutral axis is nowhere near that place. So they're not going to be coincident. Yeah. So that, that was my my confusion that maybe triggered that question. Then, then that's the interface. Then, then you have the neutral axis, which actually the neutral axis is where the actual force forces. Yeah. So those forces along, along the x-axis are zero, and if they're zero, there are no any strains, and if there are no strains, there are no stresses. So definitely, uh, this is the, the neutral axis. Sorry about that. Like this. So and again, neutral axis might or might not coincide with the interface surface. So that's here. And there is a third thing here, a parameter, which is the centroid that depends exclusively on the shape of the cross section. So the centroid uh, might be might coincide or not, but it depends on the on how unsymmetrical or how symmetrical is the section. Yeah. So let's summarize the answer to your question. It says not necessarily has to be it's not the same or it is the same. It depends on the geometry of your construction, yeah. Because if you have a square or rectangle cross section, something like this. And then you say, well, you know what? Uh, the upper side is made out of one material, something like this. So you have the red material in here, and you have the black material in here. So definitely, in this case, the neutral axis is going to coincide with the interface axis or interface region or interface. Like this, and then this one. So this is going to be, let me just draw my, something like this, and then you can say, well, this is, if I run it a little bit like that. So yes, in this case, the interface coincides with the neutral axis. So yes, yes uh, it's just in this example. So it's good that you ask this question because then I would have carried this uh, erroneous introduction on on the uh, interface surface, neural axis, and central. Yeah, thank you, not interface. Thank you for raising the, the question. Awesome. Let me hear how this. Yeah. Perfect. So now that we have the strength, the, the strength like this, we know that because of the difference on the young modules, because we know that stress. That stress is related to strain, like in this fashion here. So it's strain times some your modules. And if we assume that the your modulus of this material is different from the your modulus of this material too, then we're going to have different stresses at different points. So if I draw the stresses, for example, at the top of this part here, so this is stress one or stress uh, let's call it one. It's at point A. So saying that this is point A and this is point B. And let's call the interface point C. So the stress is going to be something, yeah? And then at point B, the stress is going to be another something. I don't know how much it's going to be. But here, the stress of B is going to be equal to what? Well, to the strain here at B, this small piece here, and let's call this A, times B2. And then in A, we're going to have that that's going to be equal to the strain at A, this one that I have here, times the your modulus one. Yeah. So they are going to be totally different. So for sure, I can draw a line like this. Now, something interesting happens in the interface line here because I know that the stresses in material one are going to vary linearly 
towards from compression to tension or tension to compression, depending on the loading case. So this is going to sort of be kind of coming like this onto the interface here. Yeah. But that ends there. So there is nothing else there because there is no more material one after that. So what we have is now the, the beginning of material two. And then here, I'm going to have a stress in here in this part, maybe this blue, one strain at C. But that strain at C, if, we, if I look it from the point of view of material one, it's going to be, well, uh, it's going to generate what? Well, one straight strain at C is going to be equal to what? So that strain at C1 times material one. But then it's going to create also one stress is still material two, well, that is the same strain because they are both the same for, for the same for both materials, but they're going to be different. How much different, larger or, or smaller? Well, that depends on how much are those on modulus, moduli. And then, but we could just put it something like this, you know, that the stress due to material, to material two is larger than the material one. And then this is going to cross something like zero here because we have to respect that, you know, at the initial axis, there is no actual force, and if there is no actual force, there is a strain, and there is a stress, then there is going to be something like this. So it's going to be very weird. This is exaggerated and it's not at scale, so it means that it's something, anything, it could be a very different uh, way like that. Yeah. So now we, the only thing, again, to summarize that for sure we know that the strains are going to vary linearly smooth, you know, from top to bottom and that's going to be it, but stresses are going to be different and they're going to be different because of what? Well, because of the difference in the long moduli for both, for both materials. Great. Now, so if I wanted to use the definition of strain that I, well, I didn't finish writing it, let me just uh, also write down strain here in X as, so we know that one divided by the radius of curvature equal to the curvature is represented by K. So well, you know, also this can be represented as minus KY. So also that's another way to, to look at things there. So if that's the case, I could call this like, if I have two materials, I can say that, you know what? Do I have a question? No. That in general, the stress in any any point or any point of material, not any point, but you know, in material one along the lines that we're going to be analyzing here, due to bending moment, is going to be represented like or something like this. And for material two, it's going to be represented as something like this. Okay. Now What happens with these cases here is that if I integrate this over the area, I'm going to have something like like helping me that is going to help me find what is the position of the nickel axis. Yeah? Because one of the things that is very interesting for us as engineers is to find okay, where, where in the according to this geometry it is, in, it is located the nickel axis because that's one key point for us not only to know where are the maximum stresses located in the cross section, but also, no, where's the little axis you know, located there? And why you would like to have that? And then coming back to the question, well, it may be possible that at some application, you would like to have something happening on the little axis because you know that stresses are going to be zero there. So maybe a, a very soft bonding or something that is not going to say that, that shouldn't be exposed to that high stress. So you want to position that where the little axis is located and so on. So one of the things that there was is, well, where is the little axis? And then we can postulate that with a question of where is this point here that is very important for us to use the initial axis. And the way to know uh, where the initial axis is, well, we know that stresses are going to be zero. And if stresses are going to be zero, meaning that these two things need to be zero. Uh, but then, you know, to transform that into searching for uh, where is the, the initial axis located, is equivalent to say, well, you know, the initial axis is located where the force, the actual force, something like this, one plus just x1 plus the actual force into the sum is equal to zero. So there is where the middle axis is. Now knowing that force equal to stress times area, but if we take it to a very small element of area in that sense, then we could propose the equation for the axis or to find the axis 
uh, something like this. So if we talk about material one, well, you know, it's going to be this stress here times the differential of area plus the integral of the stress that is developed in material two times the mixture of area, and that has to be zero. Now, knowing this, that sigma x1 and sigma x2 are can be substituted by this geometrical relationship here that depends on the strain, then that's something that we could write like, like for as c1 ky ga minus, so this is minus and minus, sorry about this. Two, two, K, Y, then times the differential of area has to be equal to zero. Then if we assume that the assume that the curvature is constant for both pieces, yeah, so it means that I could just take this K as common factor and put it to the other side of the zero, provided that this curvature meaning that it's not zero either. So let's say K it has to be different than zero and both equal in, or equal in both cases. And I could write this equation something like this. I can the modulus bracket something like this and plus this record the modulus on the other side here. Then these two integrals so represent the first moment of the two materials, the two parts of the cross sectional area with respect to the neutral axis. Then if there are more than two materials which they're going to find that it's possible, but it's not that common. Usually you see people, you know, when you see composite units, uh, they try to, they concern it mostly with two materials. Then you just add up the terms in any of these, uh, let's say, parts here. So if you have three materials, then you know you have a third term in here. But these ones represent, you know, the first moment of the two parts, okay, with respect to the neutral axis. And this is very similar to the equation for a beam of, beam of one material. So it is something that, you know, it's a tool that you have in case you want to find the position of the initial axis, let me mark it like this. And when you are not in the presence of something that is called double symmetrical beam. So double symmetrical mean beams are something like this, for example, this rectangle or a composite beam that forms a whole rectangle, a sandwich beam, for example, this is a double symmetrical beam, all of these are double symmetrical beams. So when you track when you draw the axis of symmetry, you're going to find that they are the most both axes are in symmetry, so they are double symmetrical beams. So when that's not the case, then you have the tool to find out where the interlap is. Now, uh, now when that we know how to find the, the interlap is, well, it would be important for us to know what is the relation that exists uh, be between uh, moment and curvature. So how the curvature is going to influence uh, the moment and vice versa, because you can input a, a, flex uh, a flexural moment on the beam, and then that's going to create a curvature, it's going to bend the beam, and so on. So let's say, Basically, in a nutshell, and let me write down the title here, moment curvature relationship. So when we talk about composite beam of two materials, then this moment curvature relationship can be determined. One of the ways that it can be determined is by saying, you know what? Uh, the, moment, the moment resulting from the bending stresses is equal to the bending moment acting on the cross section. So if you remember from our first lecture that we said, well, you have something that you can see that are those bending moments applied to the beam, and then there is that something that you cannot see that are those stresses that are generated in the interior of the material. Well, one of the ways to find what's the relation that exists between moment and curvature is then, well, you know, just take the bending moment, the load, the load applied to the beam, and then equal that to the bending stresses resultant due to those moments, and then you can have kind of this relationship between both of them. So let's do that. So that is, if we have the moment, bending moment equal to integrated the whole area equals equal to this. Just remember that this in the end is going to become some sort of inertia. So that's why it's it something like this. Then, okay, so this is for one material. So, but now if we're in the presence of a composite beam, with two materials in it, well, this people is just, just need to split this into the number of materials they're using there. So this could be two split into or material one, they're going to have the stress one, 
then we are going to have the stress developed in the second material. Like this. And then you can say, well, you know what? I could still, I know that, again, you know, these stresses, as mentioned in the bottom here, these two, I could bring them. Like this. I can substitute them in here. And say, well, you know what? This, let me write it again. So it's going to be in the end if I put all of that, and then if I assume that this is constant, and this is constant. And this and sorry, K, sorry. And these two are constant. And if I take that away and take into account the, the minus sign there, oh, well, this is going to be equal to K E1. Where the A plus K C two and the integral just consider only the second material the A. Now we all know what is the this is the second moment of error, this expression here, or the aka moment of inertia. Then we could write this equation as M equals equals to curvature, then which is common for both AI one plus AI two. So what's happening here, so uh, just to emphasize that, you know, I1 and I2 are the moments of inertia about the axis of the representation they're using for both uh, for both cross-sectional uh, areas of materials one and two. And then we also need to be aware that by doing this, that, that this comes from this generalization here, so that if we're going to say that the total moment of inertia, you can call it I or IT, for example, is going to be equal just to summing both moments of inertia, meaning that the generality of the geometry the geometrical description of the cross section is not lost as a whole. You know? So, because this is the IT, is the total moment of inertia of the entire cross section of what you have here with about the middle axis. So, then if you want to, okay, well, how much is the curvature here? Well, we know that curvature is just a representation, not much used, but is important for deformation purposes later. But the curvature, which I mentioned as equals to one divided is the reciprocal of the radius of curvature, well, that equals to this one here. And and it's going to be divided by this. And this is fine to be presented in this formula because you're going to know why. The important term here is that this one here, the denominator here, is called flexural rigidity. And then it has to turn because it's a complicated thing. What questions do you have? Now that we have found the relation between moment and curvature, then the following question would be to ask, okay, what about stresses? More specifically, the normal stresses or special formula. So let's, let's see what happens with the normal stresses. Then we already know that, uh, let's see. Okay, we have this simple but powerful formula. I'm going to put, it, put them here. And this says, you know, if you want to know the stresses you could bending, well, tell me what the your module, tell me what's the curvature, curvature of the case, and then give me a point so I can tell you how much is the normal stress at that point. So basically, the purpose of finding the, the relation between moment and, and curvature was to find this term, so we could include it in here, and then find a, the formula for normal stresses on a bending case or flexural formula. Yes. So let's do it. So the, actually, the fact that we are using two materials instead of one doesn't make this more complicated than it is. So they're just seeing that now. So for example, if I introduce this one in here, so this, I can write them like m times y times E1, and then the going to be divided by the flexural rigidity, which is this one, E1, I1, plus E2, I2, like this. And for the case of the other material, it's going to be minus M, Y, I2, E2, sorry, and it's still terms. And then the flexural rigidity of the compounded equation. Like this. Mm -hmm. 
not very much different from the case where we have just one material like this. You can do the kind of the exercise if you want to, and you have time. Most of you don't have time, but if you just say that the ion modulus of material one equals to your modulus of material two, what you're going to find out is that this is going to be reduced to the stresses on a beam on the bending moment made out of one material. And, that's it. and these are the only equations you would need for a general case of calculating this type of application. What's the complexity then on your side? So what could be tedious, what could be boring on this type of solution is that, well, I'm using one weird section or you have this type of, let's say, arrangement, and then most of the work is going to be dedicated to finding out, for example, uh, where is the uh, middle axis or what are the inertia values for all those cases. So you are going to spend some time calculating inertia and position of middle axis, but then after you have those values computed, then you just put it in here and that's it. It's done, uh, it's coming over. So most of the time it's going to be preparing to apply this formula, not all the other way around. What questions do you have? Now, there is now interesting applications such as these sandwich beams. And there are approximate theories to compute bending on sandwich beams. Not only bending, but stresses due to bending on some things. Yeah. Those are taken from the general formulas, but they are a little bit oversimplified. So let's take a look at that. And let me call it approximate theory for sandwich computations or with the sandwich beam. Of course, we're talking about bending. Then I'm going to draw what would be a sandwich beam. We're going to have three rectangles. So we have a, a material, not a line. Larger, like this. Then we're going to have a couple of This is more or less what sandwich beams do. This is more or less what. Then you have this one material here on the top, usually metal, aluminum, something much more, much more high strength than the one in the middle. And uh, let me draw a Cartesian coordinate system pretty similar to the one that I used before, something like this, where we have Y and V here. So this is going to be material one, and this is also material one, so they are both the same. Then I have a material two here, like this. And let's put some dimensions. We have the internal height of this core material, let's call it core material, and it's going to be A to C. I'm going to have a total height of the whole beam, I'm going to call it H. And then this part, you know, typically we're going to call it T, maybe a thin thickness, of those plates that we're using there. So we have T here and also on the bottom. So this is the characteristic of uh, representation of a sandwich beam. It's double symmetrical, so mutual axis is going to be the same choice, but the, the separation surface or the interfaces are not there, you know, with any of those. So let's assume something first. There are a couple of cases that we could get in here. So those two cases, I'm going to write them down here for case one. So one hypothesis we can have is that, so what about if the, uh, the modulus of elasticity, the modulus of material one, is way larger, exaggerately larger than material two. So that's one of the cases. Mm -hmm. So if this is what is happening, then we could say that, you know what, uh, we are not, we are going to, uh, let's say, we will disregard, disregard the normal stresses in the core or in material two. 
So meaning that you no, know, this is not going to we are not going to be worried about you know that 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 the core material two is going to receive any bending stress, but all bending stress is going to be absorbed by material one. So that's probably you know kind of the, the those those plates that we have at the top. So this regard, are normal stresses. At the core. Thank you. So if then if this is the case, then we're going to say that you know what that stress is normal stress too. It's not going to be zero because you no know, in comparison is not is something that I'm not going to, we're not going to use. But then it means that the stresses on the plate, the outer part of that sandwich beam, are going to be represented like M Y that I want. Kind of if it were just one material. The only thing is to know, okay, how much is I want? So there is a formula already that people have because it's a very typical cross section. So we can have a, we don't have to reinvent the wheel here. So we could have, we can have a, a formula for those, uh, for that moment of inertia in this case. So, well, how much is that? Well, the moment of inertia one, but it's, it's like seeing this cross section just by the blue plate or blue sections here and the, the either axis that is that coincides with the centroid is something, you know, going like this. Let me just put it as a, the people access. Well, that's going to be equal to, you know, if of a rectangular section, the moment of inertia is base times the height to the power of three divided by 12, uh, taking from a initial axis cross in the middle, but because remember that inertia is measured with respect to something, and in this case, inertia is measured about the uh, initial axis, then this formation is something like the base divided by 12 times for the height, but the height is going to be represented as something like this. Pretty simple formula. And where this comes from? Well, we need to know that definitely the HC can be represented like A minus 2T. Okay. Well, T is this thickness of the phase, so if you introduce that there, so this is why this is happening. Now, the golden question is, so where are the maximum stresses appearing in this composite beam? Well, max maximum stresses are definitely going to be appearing here at the top and here on the bottom. So we can call this sigma top and sigma bottom, like this. Depending on how the forces are applied, top might be in flexion, might be in, compre in compression, tension or compre compression, depending on the case. So but we definitely can say that the, the stress at the top is going to be equal to our well. Going to be equal to how much is the distance from the center to the top? Well, it's going to be half h, and that's going to be h divided by 2 i1, and then the bottom again, six times depends on the loading case. This is just a standardization of writing things, you know, why the minus is here and why not positive, right? Depends on the loading case. And you definitely would, would get if you have clearly a compression stress, compressive stress at the top, you, you, you would see because the curvature, you know, is not. Concept at the top, but it's different. So you would see, depending on the time, how much it is. And to elaborate a little bit more on that, so if the bending moment is positive, and when I say that the bending moment is positive, is because maybe we can, we can write it here. We have a a beam like this. Well, it would be nice to write them as we have right now. So imagine that we have this composite beam, this one, and then I just copy it. And then we have a core material. And then this is attached to the ground, saying that this is a continuous beam or something like that. So depending on the axis or how we're putting the axis, we can say, well, you know what, the bending moment is positive if it does something like this. Yeah. So if positive, definitely, definitely, this is going to be in compression. And this is going to be in tension. Now, the thing is that when you apply these formulas, instead of applying the general formulas that we, we derived at the beginning, let me show you which one, this one here, you could apply both of them. But the difference is that this, the result, and this is the result of using the approximate theory for, for some beam, beams, is that these stresses are going to be a little bit kind of, I would say, higher than the ones given here. So we're going to first make an exercise where you now we are going to use both theories to calculate the stresses at the top and the bottom of the sandwich beams by using both theories, and we're going to see, well, that there is a difference. These, the approximate theory is 
or we're going to try to give you higher values of stressor, and you're going to be overstate and reduce the value of the stressor. But it doesn't, well, no, it, it's not that much of a difference, so it's okay, you can, you can use it, no problem. So to put it another way, in other, say, on the words, uh, it's another word is that the stresses produced by these formulas are, mm, let's say, conservative in comparison to these formulas here on the, on the bottom. So those ones are given more conservative values than these ones here. Then we have the second case, and the second case happens when the thickness of the top and bottom plates are very, very small compared to the height of the core of material two. So let's see. And the only thing that that does, or, or the thing that the information that that carries and is giving us is, let me write down here, K2. when T is way smaller than K2. So what's happening here in terms of what is giving us is that when we look at the problem from the point of view of the shear stresses, then shear stresses, well, this is going to change a lot, meaning that the shear stress, and this is a simple, let's say, note here, just for information, is that the shear stress, as an average, because remember the shear stress depends on where along the, the cross section you are you're measuring it. So it's not linear, the shear stress is not linear, so it changes. And there's a nice theory of on why the, the shear stresses have certain, which they are not linear, but they have certain sort of parabolic you know, form or circular form. And it's because you know how the, the planes slide among, across each other or along each other. But in this case, it's the case focus here on, on the average shear stress. Well, we know the average shear stress equals what the shear force divided by the area, so that's the average. So we can call it that what is equal to this and the area. But in the area, as I'm disregarding the thickness of the upper and lower plate, so the area is going to be just the width of the plate, which I didn't mark here. So it's going to be the width in here times the height, but as t is very small, so it's going to be something like this. So this is the only note here. And if I'm more interested, I say, okay, what about the shear strain? Well, the shear strain is going to be 25, again, average. Going to be this divided by what? Well, the only thing I need to do is basically multiplying the shear stress times b, uh, let's say the shear modulus of elasticity of the core material, and that's going to be this that gives, gives me the shear stress, and then we put, well, in this case, we need to divide the shear modulus of elasticity of the core material. But this is just as a reference for, as an average reference for things, remembering that shear stresses have a maximum and a minimum. Any questions so far? There is one part that is always thought, I'm not going to mention here, but what is called the, the transform section method, but some people use it, they say they use, but uh, but in this case, with this formula, you can cover everything to, to calculate things in here, yeah? So this is where the theory for our lecture ends. But uh, I would like to leave you maybe with, with an example. Yeah, as we are not going to have any sessions next week, so it would be better to, to have an example of the application of the mm -hmm. yeah. example. And this is a typical example that you can find in textbooks, but also it's very uh, real life oriented. So let me bring this section here. And then finish. Because we're going to say that this is what we're going to be using. So there is our identity on this. Uh, we know that these are small materials. This is this. This is this. this, is this. So we this one. Yeah. So we have a sandwich beam, and we're going to have this is aluminum. Alloy. Let's call it aluminum. Aluminum alloy. And we're going to say that what we have here here is plastic, plastic core. So this portion is this, and this portion is this. It's possible plastic and aluminum alloy. Okay. Then we're going to say that this cross section is going to be subjected to a bending moment of 3,000 
given per zero. And let's say that the dimension for them to use that these are look at this five millimeters. This is very small. This is five millimeters. This is the purpose of a time machine. The core height is going to be 150 millimeters, meaning that the total height is going to be 150 millimeters. While the width of that cross section is going to be 200 millimeters. We're going to consider that modulus of elasticity of the aluminum alloy, the well in the is 72 gigapascals. And for the plastic core, it's going to be 800 megapascals. Question to answer is how much is this at the top, the stress at the top, and how much is the stress at the bottom using the general theory for composite beams and the approximate theory for composite beams. And we're going to see what are the difference of that. Yeah. So one of the first let's say, points to, to tackle here is to say, okay, where is the middle axis? Because as remember, uh, we need to understand where the middle axis is. And as this is double symmetric, it means that the middle axis is in the middle of everything. So here is where the uh, uh, the limited part, you know, erected part, neutral axis here. So that's what, that is the first thing. And let me bring the equation to you here. So the left, this one. So these are terms for general equations, general, general theory. And let me bring this one that is for this one here. You can copy it over. These are for the approximate theory. In both cases, uh, one thing that we need to have is is uh, where are the moments of inertia? So we said that uh, the moment of inertia, the moment of inertia one of material one, we know that we could use this formula to calculate it, this one here. So that would be, let me write down the formula again. 1 divided by B, 12, okay. So it's going to be C divided by 12, H power 3, H E power 3. And that's going to be equal to what? Right? Write down the value. So the width is going to be 200 millimeters. So divided by 12 times uh, this H divided by HC. So this is going to be maybe 60 millimeters to the power of 3 minus 150 millimeters to the power of 3. Then I1 is going to be equal to. And let me try to bring a copy of how to. Bring it here. I didn't configure this. Give me just a second while I open this. Yeah, I believe I can. You're going to have access to this too. I hope you can. Yeah. So let's put that to the question there. So I want. That's going to be equal to what? To B, uh, it's going to be 200 divided by 12 times 150 millimeters to the power of 3 minus 150 millimeters to the power of 3. And then if I get this value here, well, is uh, this much? Is 120 something? Let me go back to, to one note. And I'm going to write it like this. Of one something seven times ten to the power of six millimeters, and then this is going to the power of three times millimeters, millimeters to the power of four, like this. Yeah. 
yang dimaki itu kalau kita punya kekuatan yang baik. Dan in Asia 2, or in Asia 2, is simple because it's just b divided by 12 times the height to the power of 3, the height of the core, and that's going to be, again, 200 millimeters divided by 12 times 150 millimeters to the power of 3. And that's going to be equal to And compared to B, this is very small. Okay. So this is going to be 5, 6, 2, 5 times power 6. Now, one thing that we said is that the total moment of these two, the sum of these two moments of inertia that we have just found, is equal to at B equal to the total moment of inertia if we calculated the whole section here. So that's one of the cases we could we could do, or we could uh, say prove that no, we got we got it correctly. So that's something we could. So how much is the total height? It's 160. So let's make a test on this part here. So let's go here. So what about if I say that I total uh, total equal to I1 plus I2. Ah, no. We are doing that. This is wrong. Delete, delete, and delete. So it's going to be I total equals to I1 plus I2. That would be equivalent to calculate I to the total. Let's call it C. It's base divided by. 12 times the height to the power of 3. And that's exactly the same. All right. So if you are working with a complex shape, a complex cross section, and you're calculating those moments of inertia, and you want to make sure that what you calculated is correct, then this is a valid step to verify that the calculations are going correctly. So let's go back. All right. Now that we have calculated this, these values, so we could proceed in several ways. So we can calculate straight away what are the, the maximum and minimum stresses at the top and the bottom. Sorry, the maximum stresses at the top and the bottom. And we could do it by saying, you know what, where is my data? So stresses. Equal to what? Well, we have here this one. And uh, so is the values or these values here. So we have in both terms the denominator, which is the flexural rigidity. So we could calculate the flexural rigidity because that is something that we need to, to use. You see, uh, flexural rigidity, rigidity. So it's I1 times E1 times I1 plus E2 times I2. So that's basically going to be equal to what? To E1, which is 72 gigapascals, and I2, which is 800 megapascals. Mm -hmm. So just a second, we'll, we'll, we'll get this. So that's going to be equal to what? So we have that 1 megapascal. I don't have it in my a simple calculation. I don't have it in my bank. Number one megapascal equals to one newton per square millimeter. So this is something we need to keep in mind because now I can multiply directly this E2 800 megapascals because the data harmony in the unit I'm using, but with gigapascals, well, I would have to multiply it by a thousand so to make an harmony in the unit. So how much is going to be? Well. Going to be equal to 
in this question that we're going to write here. So 72 gigapascal, so I could write it down as 72,000 newtons per square millimeter times I1, and I1 is this one here, oh, but it's going to be very long. Let's do something, let's do it straight away into zero by saying that E1 is going to be 72,000 at this newton per square millimeter, and that E2 is going to be 800 newtons per square millimeter. So let's go back to uh, GeoGebra and get that calculation there. So we have that E1 equals to 72,000 and E2. That's why I like those programs. There's a, there's a library in Python, for example, that you could handle all these yields automatically for you. It would be nice to, to use them in this case, it's 800. So the flexure I repeat it to, SR, is going to be E1 times I1 plus E2 times I2. Wow, this is 910. How much is this? 3, 3, 3. Wow. Let's go back to this. Mm. Actually, just going to look for an equivalent. Because this can be written as molecular rigidity. One, two, three. Thousand, thousand, yeah. Then I can write it down as one time, one time. And two newtons per square meter. Okay. Then sigma one. Maximum. It could be plus or minus because remember that if we are here, so one of them is going to be in compression, another one is going to be in tension. So I just, the magnitude is going to be the same, but the sign is going to be different. So for material one, that maximum stress is going to be equal to the moment times the height divided by two times E1 divided by the flexural rigidity that we just calculated. And one plus I2 like this. And that's going to be equal to what? Well, how much is the moment? The moment is going to be 2,000 uh, 2, newton meter. 22,000 newton meters times the height divided by two. The total height is 150 millimeters divided by two is 80 millimeters. But as I'm talking in, I need to harmonize the, the unit, so it's going to be times 0 0.080 meters yeah, times E1. But E1, how much is E1? Is this one? Is how much here? So and let me just change this uh, to uh, just a quick change from 72 gigapascals to uh, newtons per square meter. How much is that? So this is going to be equal to 7.2 times 10 to the power of 10, 10 newtons over square meter. And this is going to be divided by the flexural rigidity formula, which is, is 910.2 newtons per square meter. Like that. Let me just recheck. Uh, this is wrong because uh, this, this one is, is, is not correct, this one here. Because, but because uh, if I, this is in square millimeters, so if I want to take it to square meters, I have to move the six zero, so three and three. So it's 110, 910,200, so you can see. It needs to be, this is, this is wrong. That's why it was, I was, so no, it shouldn't be like that. So this is 200, like this. Great, so let's check the units in here. So here I have meters and meters that cancels out with this one. Let me check this one and this one. They cancel out with this one. Uh, one newton of field cancel out with this one, and then you end up with newtons 
Pues miro esto aquí, que está black. No, voy a intentar que la IP es quiero, pero... Plot minus, vamos a ver. Ah, ok. Yo sí, yo sí, yo sí. So we have... Mm, let me write the, the value term. I'm going to say 2000, tiny 0.08. I hope you can see them, yeah. 8 times 7.2 times t to the 10th to the power of 10. And that's going to be divided by. And this can be divided by. Yeah. So this is 3 and 3. Yeah, so this is giving me in Pascals. And then, so basically, it's 19 megapascals. Now this is in the on the outer part of material of material one, meaning in here on the top or at the bottom depending on the loading case. But if we look at okay, how much is at the core? So how much is the maximum at the core? And that we calculating it in here, it must be top and here, it must be bottom. So we can do that calculation also using the same formula. So for material two, this is going to be equal to what? Again, it's plus minus because it's double symmetric. And then it's going to be n times uh, the distance from the neutral axis to the point we want to investigate for. And that's going to be this hc, which is 120 millimeters divided by two. So this is going to be hc divided by two times e2. And that's going to be divided by the flexural rigidity, e1 e1 i1 plus e2 i2. How much is this? Well, I continue with the 2,000 newton meters moment, apply to it. Uh, I continue HC. HC is 75 millimeters, but I'm going to represent it as 0 0.075 uh, meters. And then we have 800 megapascals. So, so 800 megapascals. Yeah, evidently. Eight times ten to the power of eight newtons per square meter, harmonization of units, and that's going to be divided by the relativity that we have calculated already, so nine ten to hundred newtons per meter square, or newtons per meter square. The units are going to be consistent with what we have at the, at the beginning. So, this is mass. So, sigma to mass is going to be equal to plus minus. How much is that? Go back to zero zero. It's going to be 3000 times 0 0.075 times a times 10 to the power of 8 divided by 910 to 100. So, look at this. Uh, this is in Pascal, so 197,758 Pascal. So let's go back to that. Because if it's that in Pascal, we can write it as 0 point to be consistent with this as well, 19.8 megapascal. So in, look at this. The stresses are mostly carried out by the external plate, even though they are 5 millimeters thick compared to the 150 millimeter of the plastic. And how much is that? It's about 100 times uh, larger, kind of hard. So in the metallic part, in the aluminum alloy part, the stresses are about 100 times larger than in the plastic part. So that's, that's why this is very convenient, because uh, it helps you reduce weight uh, while keeping some geometry factors and still being uh, having a strength that you can use in the, in the future. This is awesome. So this is for the first part. And now to finalize, so what is where the results using the approximate uh, theory? So again, this is going to be equal to this. So uh, let me take it mh divided by 2 i1. Because let's remember that the, the elastic modulus of the plastic is weighs more than the, the one from the, from the aluminum alloy. So I say approximate theory. Again, I can write it like the approximate theory we're going to have only for the material one, because we're going to say, you know what, the stresses at the material two are nothing, so we're not going to consider it. So mass 
I don't think it's equal to two at two plus minus, is that m h divided by q i one. And again, it's 2000 newton meters. H, H is 160, yeah? Times 0 0.160 meters divided by two times moment of inertia one, and moment of inertia one is this one here, this was 0 0.017 times 10 to the power of four, was it? What was six? Ah, but this is millimeter square, so we need to put it in terms of square or of square meters. So we could easily say, what well, you know what? Mm, let me go back to to do a quick conversion here. So this is millimeter square. That means it's the power of four, like this. Yeah. So we're going to say that four four. So let me see how much is that I need to. I don't want to make that so lengthy calculation. So what I could do is transform this a little bit so I can transform this into equivalent things that that would mean so I can say this in computer. Then I could say that thousand millimeters is one meter here. Times 156 millimeters, and then this is going to be divided by now this was 17 to the power of 6 millimeters to the power of 4. Then this is going to cancel out with this, and there's going to be open two, so it's going to be Newton per square millimeter, which is mega Pascal. And let's go to the algebra, and we're going to have 3000 times 1000. Times 150 divided by 2 times 12.17 times 10 to the power of 6. Well, here it is 19.97 megapascals, because this is already given us in megapascals. So let's go back to this. So, sigma 1 mass using the approximate theory plus minus. 19.97 megapascals, a little bit larger than the one that is giving us using the general theory. So how much different? A little bit, but if you go back to the algebra, so, well, this is the value here for, for that sigma one max is 18.98, so let me come back here. So this is really in here. 18.98 megapascals. Just, yeah. And compared to this, well, it's about one megapascal in this point. Yeah. So not much. It's a bit higher, but you no, know, it's still that's the job, and it's not that exaggerated higher. Well, and this is uh, the end of this lecture. Well, it was shorter by an hour than the other one. Very simple. Very practical in use. Definitely, there, there, there are software that can automate the calculation of this, but knowing uh, what is behind scenes is what gives you the power to decide if the results that the software are given are in the right shape or not. Remember, you know, that in IT is that everything that you no know, garbage in, gar garbage in, garbage out, in that if you don't know what you're putting into the software, then whatever you take out the software is useless for you, uh, provided that you know, you know that what you're putting inside of the software is something that doesn't make sense, but still the software is going to give you a result. And then you're going to, if, you're, if you don't know this basic theory behind what the software is doing, then you would say, oh, yes, no, whatever, whatever the software gives me, that is, you know, I accept it as the yes. But now if you have certain basic knowledge about, you know, what is being done, then you can decide by yourself, yes, this makes sense or no, this doesn't make sense. Let, let me review something before accepting the results of the software. Yeah, and um, very simple, uh, even if I would say this is about compromising, it's just an extension to just one other thing, and not much happens. What questions do you have? If not, I wish you a nice weekend and uh, take care. I'll see you for the last class of our subject next week. And remember, next week I will give some pointers about the time. So don't miss it. Take care.